Welcome to our webinar, How to Develop Effective Screeners that Garner Quality Respondents. I'm your host, Monica Gilson. M3 would like to thank you for being here with us today, and wherever you are in the world, we hope you're doing well and staying safe. I am joined by three colleagues today, Aaron Daniels, Mary Seiler, and Miriam Haynes. Aaron Daniels is our Associate Director of U.S. Panel. Aaron is responsible for overseeing the recruitment and engagement of M3 U.S. Healthcare Panel. She also assists in recruiting hard to reach healthcare professionals and patients at a project level. Erin has over 15 years of experience in market research managing consumer, business, healthcare, and proprietary panels. She has extensive experience in quantitative and qualitative fieldwork and project management. Erin graduated from the University of Toledo and has continued her career in development in market research, including the Riva Qualitative Project Management and Screener Development Training Course. Mary Seiler is our Associate Director of Qualitative Research and has been with M3 for almost five years, but has spent the past 13 years in market research. Mary joined M3 as a Qualitative Project Manager and was promoted to her current position two years ago. Mary has a BS in Advertising from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and holds the Professional Researcher Certification from the Insights Association. And last but certainly not least, Miriam Haynes is our Global Head of Survey Programming. She joined M3 in 2018, but has been working in market research for over two decades. In her current position, she lends her operational expertise to oversee survey programming, data processing, and quality control as it relates to process development, pricing, and problem solving. Miriam earned her BS and MA in economics from Matej Bell University in Slovakia and holds an MBA in marketing and market research from the University of Pittsburgh. We will be taking questions at the end. If you'd like to open the Q&A function from the webinar console now, you can submit your questions anytime during the webinar. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function. Erin, Mary, and Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Monica, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's great to have so many colleagues with us for what we hope to be an informative and an interactive session. I'm Erin Daniels, let's get started with our agenda. Today we're going to focus on a few key areas, the importance of screeners, what screeners should contain to gather quality respondents and data. We're going to have a little bit of fun with a game to provide you with some clear examples of our recommendations. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions as Monica mentioned. First up, why are screeners important? There are two perspectives when thinking about the importance of screeners. Uh, first, for the research sponsor, it's to ensure that the right respondents are part of the research study. You wanna make sure you're obtaining good results to validate, to make sure that the data is valid and insightful. You know, there's so much that goes into your the overall research projects. You wanna make sure the data you're collected is from the right respondents. And then of course, from the participant or the respondent perspective, we want to make sure we're providing them with a positive engagement and a meaningful experience. We want them to feel valued and not used. By doing so, your participants will be more likely to provide thoughtful and genuine responses, whether that's online or in person. Next, let's look at what should be included in a good screener. Uh, the overall design should be based on the recruitment methodology. We want to ask only essential questions. Use appropriate language and wording for your audience. And you, you of course, want to make sure you're correctly targeting your audience. In the next few slides, Mary and I will review each of these points in more detail. We'll give you some ideas and some recommendations that you can use uh, to make the most of your screeners. Thinking about this overall screener design and the recruitment methodology. We ask that, we recommend that you make your questions and your wording method agnostic. So what we mean by that is making sure that your screener style, the language, the wording is the same, regardless of whether you're recruiting online, um, by email or by phone. Uh, a couple examples of this, maybe your standard introduction assumes that that it assumes a phone recruitment. And it says, hello, my name is Aaron from M3 Global Research. Whereas if we're doing it online, you wouldn't really use that. So you would use, you know, we're conducting a study about, you know, such and such. So both of those methods though, but that type, that second introduction would work for both methods. And if you're thinking from a, a question standpoint, 
on a phone, you might assume, you know, you might uh, ask an open end, whereas online we provide a list. So we ask that whatever method we're using, you're using for recruitment, that, you know, you make sure that it's method agnostic, that it will work for all. And in many cases, particularly with a uh, qualitative, we might be utilizing many methods, especially for hard to reach respondents. So it's good to be able to have something that's feasible for all. Next, we ask that you only ask essential questions. And this goes back to what I previously mentioned about ensuring participants have a good experience. Something we hear often from participants and respondents is that screeners are too long, that we're collecting uh, data unnecessarily or maybe even for free. Um, so we want to make sure that if we ask only essential questions, then the respondents don't feel that their information is used uh, for, a larger, for a larger research project. And if we make sure we're asking only essential questions, then we'll make sure we get genuine responses from them. We know that long screeners wear respondents out and the quality goes down. And if you apply good screener writing, most screeners you can get with you can stay within the recommended 10 to 15 questions. Next, we want to make sure that the qualifying criteria is all in separate questions. Um, may sound may sound you know obvious, but we do often see that maybe if you're trying to shorten a screener, you might combine questions into one. But if you do that, your responses are not going to be accurate because they may be answering one of those questions and maybe not it, it may not be fully answering all your questions. So we want to make sure that in our screener that um, each question is clear, specific, and so that respondents are not likely to get confused and that we leave no room for misinterpretation by the respondent. We have some good examples of this coming up in our, in our slides coming up. And the, the last two uh, kind of go together, disqualifying the masses sooner rather, rather than later, and, but also allowing for low um, flexible, flexibility with low IR projects. So with this, we recommend that you start with your key qualifying criteria, the things that you must have, your termination points that you're, you know, if, if, somebody, if somebody does not meet this criteria, somebody does not meet this, this qualification that we can get them out of the screener and they can go, they can move on to something else. Then we recommend your, um, your other points, maybe your preferences, behaviors, interests, things like that come after that so that your, you, so that maybe your, your, the things that your criteria are, can be flexed on, you ask those next. An example, if you have a study and you know you need rheumatologists and neurologists, eliminate the nurse, you know, you can ask that question and then you can eliminate somebody like a nurse or radi radiologist right away. We also recommend that you avoid focusing on specific criteria. Uh, one of those examples is role versus title versus specialty. Um, think more in a broader sense of what is it going to qualify somebody and instead of focusing on one specific thing. Next up, Mary is going to go through some of the essential questions, wording, and targeting. Thanks, Erin, for the intro. I'll be diving a little bit deeper into the screener, starting with the questions. With your screener, you want to ensure you're getting the respondents you're looking for to reach your research objectives. So when you're writing your questions, you want to limit them to the terming questions and questions involving quotas. You want to avoid those information-only questions. And if you need to collect the responses for those types of questions, a good place to put them um, would be at the beginning of your discussion guide for qualitative interviews or in the questionnaire survey for quantitative research. One way to target well is to include key questions about role, specialty, and settings in your medical screeners. This is to make sure you're targeting um, the correct respondent and you have all their correct um, up-to-date information. The next item about key questions you want to include is a good number of response options that will qualify and disqualify respondents. In addition to including don't know, or prefer not to answer, other, or none of the above response options. This way you're not forcing a respondent to choose a response option that doesn't apply to them. Also, if you include all response options to fit all respondents, you'll avoid screening out possible good respondents. When writing your, your questions, you want to write unbiased and non-leading questions. So avoid hinting at the correct response or introducing ideas 
or opinions into questions that might influence respondents. A good question type to avoid in your screeners are yes, no questions. This type of question is leading because it hints at the correct response. Also, respondents might answer in a way they believe that will enable them to participate in the study. Another way a question can be leading is assumption, so assuming a behavior upon a respondent without verifying first. What I mean by that is asking like a frequency of use of an item without verifying that in the first place. To give an example of a leading question, if you ask, do you treat X patient with Y drug, and it's a yes, no question, um, this first question hints at the correct answer of yes, and is assuming this respondent is treating X patient. So a better way of writing this question out would be splitting it into two questions. Um, the first question asking which of the following patients do you treat, and then provide a list of different types of patients, some that qualify, some that disqualify. And then the second question would ask about the medication, which types of medications do you prescribe to X patient and provide a list. Um, again, with qualifying and terming response options. Um, that way you're not leading the respondent in any way to choose a certain answer. And it's just an overall better way to write out that question to get your information you need. Um, Miriam will also be talking about more questions as we go along. I just wanted to give one example as we are talking about it. In addition to your assuring your questions are unbiased and non-leading, you also want to make sure they're clear and not open, open to interpretation. Ways to make sure your questions are clear is to ask timeframes that can be easily recalled. Um, so stating a time frame of the past 12 months, um, not everybody might remember the past year, so it, making it a shorter time frame. And if you do need to ask about the past year, maybe asking them to the best that they remember or giving an estimate um, a number so they don't have to have the exact number they need. And also using clear units of measurement in your questions and response options. So no overlapping ranges and making sure you state the unit of measurement. Um, one example of an unclear unit of measurement is if you ask, how often do you drink coffee in the past week? And your answer options are daily, regularly, occasionally. Um, those are op open to interpretation of what regularly or occasionally means. Um, a better way to um, have response options would include a number unit, so seven or more times, five to six times, three to four. So you're not leaving anything up to interpretation. You know the exact unit of measurement that you're asking for. Next, I wanna talk about the language style. You wanna make sure your respondents can easily understand the question and response options given. When talking to a consumer, a patient, or caregiver, Ensuring everyday language and not clinical terms are being used. Um, even if a patient has X disease, he or she may not understand that clinical terminology regarding X disease. In addition, when you should be aware of the wording you're using for different healthcare professionals, um, different words, you should be using different words when interacting with a cardiologist versus a physician's assistant versus a purchasing manager. And besides making sure you have that appropriate wording, you also want to make sure your questions and responses are brief and to the point. Lots of details and questions and response options can lead to co additional confusion, and sometimes respondents will stop reading those questions that are longer and are wordy. So keep your questions and response options clear, easy, and concise. And the last item I want to speak about the language style is don't assume the respondent understands that acronym or abbreviation you're using in your screener. Um, so to avoid any confusion, it's best just to spell those out. Um, the last item I want to talk to you about are the invitation. This is just an example of a standard invitation that can be used with any recruitment method. Um, it could work with um, recruiting online over the phone. There's also other different invitation styles you can use to convey this information, but the standard stuff that you want to include in all invitations are topic, target, what the participation involves, honor area, the dates of participation, um, or the deadline of the survey. 
you want to make sure you're clearly stating the expectations of the respondents for the research without biasing them. The two items that would kind of bias a respondent would be the topic and target. You don't want to give too much detail so that respondents know what you're looking for, but you want to give the basic understanding of the topic and target so you can target the right people to start this screener. Um, it's a fine line, but we want to sure we're not biasing the respondents before starting the survey. Uh, and if you have any questions or need guidance, your recruiting PM is always available to help. Um, now I'd like to introduce Miriam to review some questions with you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Erin. Very glad to have so many participants from um, today. So we are going to do this part as a game. Um, very simple rules. There is nothing required from you to press. No kind of survey is going to come up on the screen. We are going to do it um, in three steps. First, we are going to show you less than ideal setup. It's going to be a simple question that is going to be presented on the left side of the screen. Then I'm going to give you a little bit words about that. Then we are going to let you consider this question. And um, if you want to jot down your answers, what do you think is wrong? You're welcome to, but you don't have to. And then finally, the last step, we are going to point to flaws that this question has, and we are going to suggest an alternative setup. So let's get started. So the first question we have is a specialty question. Um, many uh, healthcare surveys have that are targeted for healthcare specialists are actually do actually contain this specialty question. So an example that we have on the left side is simple question, single select, asking for medical specialty, three options. So let's consider this question and then um, we will show you what we consider to be slightly off with this question. So what we came up with is that this question is almost revealing the determination point. I can assume that if I answer the first two options, I will qualify. If I answer and select the last option of the specialty, I'm going to disqualify. So it's almost leading question, I would say. It's, it's very clearly to see what uh, is going to disqualify. Also, it's very possible that the doctor may have more than one medical specialty. There are, there are more certified in more than one specialty. So a good addition to the text of the question would be to say, what is your primary medical specialty? So it really focuses on something that we are after. Um, what we would suggest the change here is to add more answers to the list and terminate on those answers. So in this case, as you see on the right side, we added um, uh, family general practice, endocrinology, neurology, and rheumatology. And also we um, captured other in a form of other specify. So in case you have a question that you are not sure if your specialties cover everything, you may decide to terminate respondents at the end and ask all the other questions of everybody. And then based on answers to other questions, technically they can qualify and you consider their answer from other specialty as uh, okay answer to continue. The second question we have for you is a facility question. So let's bring that up. Okay, again, it's a single select question. It has four answers, other. So let's consider this question and then we can suggest an alternative solution. Okay. So what we came up here is actually asked it slightly differently. First of all, a uh, question on the left might be difficult to answer because what if my time as a doctor is split evenly between two types of facilities or um, my facility is not covered and other is basically not letting me an option to uh, specify it. So what we suggest is to change this question and let the doctor consider the percentage of the time they spend in each of the facilities listed, facility types listed below. Include other specify, and obviously this question may take a little bit longer to answer, but it would provide better answers, and also um, by having it set up online, obviously this is an online question, that when they type the answers, they don't have to type in zeros, 
and the total must add up to 100, it gives them the running total, it's a lot easier for them to answer. So in case I really spend 100% of my time of my time in, um, let's say, independent standalone facility, I can easily, or standalone hospital, I can easily just enter 100 there and be done with this question. And it took me just about the same time. If I split my time across different facilities, I would have to enter those numbers and add up to 100. Um, again, we are capturing other as a way to allow rescreening in case um, they qualified everywhere else or number of specific patients or uh, number of drug, uh, number of certain drugs, medications that are required to have. So it's a lot easier to get somebody back into, to rescreen them if this question is set up with more options than the questions on the left side. The third example we have is a yes and no question. And Mary uh, talked about how yes and no questions tend to be sometimes flawed. So the question that we have on the left uh, is asking, are you currently treating patients with ITP? Yes, no. So let's consider that question for a second and then we move to a, a better solution. Okay, so what we propose here is what we see on the left side, what is kind of clear is the termination is obvious. If I say I do not treat, <laughs> I'm not currently treating patients with ITP and I answer no, I'm going to disqualify from the survey. Uh, currently treating, uh, it's also referring to, is it right at this moment or is it within this past week? It's kind of not clear. Better way to structure it is say, are you, you know, how many patients are you treating in a let's say per year. So it gives them a time frame that they are considering because you may be looking not at just right now, but on a different um, type of um, a time frame that they have. So the time frame is uncertain and termination is kind of clear in the question on the left. What we suggest to change here is to change this question from single select to numeric, um, allow them to answer number of patients they have across more than one condition. So in this case, we included first third and fourth answer, and basically expanding the list, and then terminate the respondent as necessary. What you may decide to do is that at the beginning of screening, you may have um, an idea, okay, I'm going to terminate everybody who doesn't have at least 10 patients. But as we recruit and we come to a low incidence rate, we may decide, you may decide to rescreen respondents who have, let's say, eight patients. So, Asking the question this way will allow you to do the rescreening a lot easier instead of going after a completely new set of patients, and especially if we do not have a lot of um, those physicians available to be even reconsidered. Example number four, it's another example of yes and no question. And the question is, are you involved in contract negotiations with drug manufacturers? Again, two answers, yes and no. So let's consider this one and what would you come up with if you were tasked to reward this question? Okay, so what we suggest here is to make it a little bit more engaging. So yes and no, again, clarify, simply, um, you know, signals if I answer no, I'm probably going to be screened out. Um, instead of that, ask for a level of involvement in the same area, contract negotiations with drug manufacturers. So in this case, it's more engaging. Everybody loves to answer with a star rating, just look at Amazon. And also it allows, it allows for term adjustments. So if I start with a high mark, I want only people who are very involved um, and screen everybody else. Technically, if again, the incidence rate is proving to be low and it's a challenge to recruit those respondents, I can expand it and go to respondents who answered, let's say four, and maybe technically even three. Example number five, it's a compound question. And, and Mary already addressed that on an example. Um, and we have a specific example here. Uh, so in this case, the question reads, have you or anyone that you care for been diagnosed with diabetes currently being treated prescription medication. So it's kind of um, allowed in that question. So we consider this to be compound question. So we'll let you consider that and see if you can come up with uh, a better solution. Okay, 
So what would we suggest? We actually do not have questions shown here, but we are providing a guidance here. So the first thing would be is to split it. There are two different um, two different uh, points of view here. One of them is have you, meaning you as a respondent, or anyone you care, take care of, um, which is basically the respondent is in a position of a caregiver. So to split this question for a patient and a caregiver, ask about diagnosis across multiple conditions, basically make it not leading, right, that we are only going to talk about diabetes. So throw in other conditions in there and see if either the respondent as a patient or as a caregiver qualifies for any of those. It's possible that one of them will disqualify and let's say me as a patient will disqualify because I do not have diabetes. I didn't select that diabetes is one of the conditions that I have, I've been diagnosed for, but as a caregiver, I'm taking care of somebody who has diabetes. So technically I can answer that screener and then respond to the survey as a caregiver. Then the third point would be the treatment option. So my targeted condition is now diabetes. And let's say I am targeting medication X for that, patients who are taking specific medications for, for, for um, diabetes. So I would list a bunch of medications for um, this condition and ask them to select which ones. And again, only consider those that I am targeting for in qualification. So based on splitting this relatively simple questions into three questions, uh, I would be able to categorize my respondents either as a patient or as a caregiver, or technically even both, and consider them for the quota. If I have a certain quota for patients and for caregivers and somebody qualifies to both, we can technically, by least fill quota, put them to the category and let them know, okay, for the rest of the questions, please answer as a caregiver or please answer as a patient. And that way, actually broaden our audience we have and have an exact targeting that we need. Example number six, it's a language style question. Okay, so question on the left came up. The three answers, single select, and is asking you to specify which one of these options best applies to the respondent. Let's read through that and then we will suggest an alternate solution. Okay, so what we would suggest here is actually make it a multi select question instead of single select question. With the last answer saying none of the above applies to me. And basically reward this question to make it less wordy. There is a lot of text on the left, especially in answers. And if somebody is completing it on a mobile phone, let's say, they would have to do a lot of scrolling just to be able to see everything on the screen. So by changing it to the first answer, which applies to me as a, care, as a, as a, as a patient, the second being as a caregiver, um, and the third one being none of the above, again, I can target, I can answer you know, both or one and uh, have a better targeting with this new setup rather than with the previous setup. Okay, and the last example that we have, it's an introduction question. I know Mary talk about how invitation to the survey is important, how it shouldn't be biased, it shouldn't be leading, it should provide information about the deadline or the duration when the study is going to be in field about the, the honoraria that the respondents are going to receive and so on. So sometimes we have this type of, the, the invitation is really limited and we have an introduction question in the survey. So an example on the left is an example that we would receive from you guys included in the questionnaire or in a screener. And as you can see, it uh, is, uh, there is something wrong with it. Um, it has some piping in it. Um, it's a single yes and no question, and uh, I let you consider it for a little bit, and then we will come up with a better solution. Okay, so what we came up with is slightly different. It is a little wordy, but it has important information. So instead of st starting with hello, my name, which is obviously not methodology agnostic question. It assumes that this is done over the phone and whoever is conducting a phone interview plugs in their name in there. Um, we are, um, we change it to be 
methodology agnostic and basically starting the R conducting the study. Many times we also see slightly uh, a variation between these two. It's not going to say hello my name, but it would say uh, I am conducting a study, which again, I, the internet, or I, the, uh, the, the interviewer is also slightly off. So we are conducting a study is the best way to start um, this introduction question. Then obviously there would be a typing for topic that would come up um, from the, uh, the uh, screener. And then um, it has clearly, it's clearly stating um, that this is going to involve 60 minute phone interview. So the respondents know what to expect. It's not revealing that we are going to only talk to oncologists who are treating lung cancer. So it's, it's really talking about the topic. Um, it also assures them that their responses are going to be treated confidentially and the data from the survey is not, even, not going to be sold to other companies to, um, for marketing calls. So it's really providing them with more information about their rights and it's not revealing the topic and um, it's also methodology agnostic. And then, um, so this rewarding really should, you know, help to target the correct respondents and help for your surveys to correct the correct data. So that's all I have for you now, and I'm going to return it back to Erin. Thank you, Miriam. Those were some great examples. I hope uh, everybody found those useful. Uh, just to quickly summarize, uh, some of the things we ask you to uh, think about for your screeners, make sure you're focusing on the essentials, be clear and concise in your wording, avoid leading respondents, uh, target the, the audience appropriately, always cover all possible answers and have a way out if not, and then and be sure to consider your methodology when, you know, when creating your screener. Thank you. Uh, we hope that you have found this to be helpful and informative and that you can reuse these recommendations for your next study. Please be sure to contact your M3 project manager on your next study to collaborate on the design of your screener. Thank you all. So we do have a few minutes and we'd like to take your questions. You may submit them now using the Q&A function. Um, we recommend that you submit your name with your question in the case that we cannot answer all of your questions in session and we can follow up with you directly. We'll also be sharing our presenters contact information if you feel your question would better be directed to one of their essential areas. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, I wanna let you know that you'll be directed to a seven question survey following the webinar where we would greatly appreciate your feedback on today's programming and any suggestions you have for future topics you would like us to cover. So our first question is, you mentioned that we should ask only essential questions. Can you talk about the limit or a specific number of questions to include in my screener? Yeah, I can take this question. Um, thank you for posing it. Okay, so what we normally recommend is go between 10 and 15, uh, with 15 being more for the qual interviews and 10 for quant. If you have any kind of questions that are not essential for screening, such as, you know, what is your gender, what is your age, what is your income bracket, and so on, the good place for those questions would be to include them at the end in the demographic questions rather than at the beginning of the screener and really focus screen on the questions that determine that you have the right um, group of respondents. If you are, if you have a survey that where you require a split of, let's say, based on gender, obviously this question would have to be in the screener. But um, the general guideline that we use at M3 is really 10 for quant and 15 for qual, with few exceptions, if um, it's extremely necessary and it's really, really um, essential to ask, but the project manager or uh, the place, person you are working from M3 should be able to advise you and provide an exception if necessary. But 10 to 15 is the normally the ratio, that the, the range that we go with. Thank you, Miriam. Our next question is, and apologies if this was already covered, but are there any tips specific to phone screening instead of online screening? Thank you for this question. Um, so I, I'm not not quite sure where, you know, if you're, there's something specific you're looking for on this. Um, overall, though, between phone and online, there there 
you know, they're very similar. You still want to make sure you're not doing anything to lead or bias. Um, you know, there is a little bit of flexibility maybe with how we ask a question on the phone as opposed to what we might show online. In fact, usually by phone, we try to, to be a little bit quicker with our, um, with how we, you know, maybe ask a question um, and allowing respondents and in, in how they how they answer because you know there's just a little bit of more flexibility but overall i mean we still would like to keep you know it's still a good idea to you know to maintain this the same um you know make sure that it's um you know that that work you're maintaining the same overall basic methods and and um unbiased questions great thanks aaron so that is all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you have additional questions that come up, please feel free to reach out to us at marketing at USA.com. Let me also share our presenters information if you want to connect to them directly. Uh, we did record this webinar and we will be sharing that recording along with the slides via email later this week. So keep your eyes out for that on Thursday. We just want to thank you again for joining us. We know your time can be sparse during what we're going through and we appreciate you spending it with us. We hope you enjoyed today's session and look forward to hearing your feedback. Take care everyone.